Welcome to Module 4 in our course on Introduction to Windows Server. And in this module, we're going to discuss file servers and storage management. When you add a physical disk, you can split that up into multiple different volumes, and each volume will get assigned a drive letter. And you can format each of those volumes into various different file systems. So you've got FAT, which is really not used all that much anymore unless you're trying to communicate with uh, other operating systems that also use FAT. FAT32 for the same reason. Uh, operating systems that will understand FAT32 would be Linux and Macintosh. So I've used thumb drives, formatted them with FAT32 and copied files from one to the other that way in certain circumstances. The most common one you're going to use in the default is going to be NTFS. And that's going to stand for New Technology File System, which, of course, once again, it's not new anymore. But uh, they haven't been able to change the name. So uh, that's what is the default, and that one works with all Windows operating systems. And then you've got the Resilient File System. That's the REFS. That's the newer one. It has a lot of additional features, such as the abis uh, ability to heal itself of certain types of errors. But it also has some limitations, such as you can't shrink an REFS volume like you can an NTFS one. And uh, it also has uh, some issues when you get it to be about halfway full, uh, it starts uh, ha having issues with uh, slowing down. So they're still working on that, but uh, it is something that is available. It's just not recommended in all situations. I've also seen some applications that refuse to run on an REFS volume. Uh, but NTFS is the generally accepted one for now. But someday, REFS will probably take over. Before you store data on a volume, you've got to format that volume so it can be used. And as I mentioned before, you've got FAT, you've got FAT32, XFAT, NTFS, and REFS. There's just going to be a lot of limited uh, ability to use any of the FAT or file allocation table formats. Uh, so I would pretty much, for the most part, just ignore them, except in very special circumstances, and just use NTFS for the most part. So there are some benefits, as I mentioned before, to REFS. It's based on NTFS, but it's not exactly like it, which is why uh, not all applications can use it, even though it says it maintains backwards compatibility. So some applications, if you try to run them on REFS, they just fail, crash, they just don't work. Um, so it's not completely backwards compatible yet. Uh, but you know, it, I, I have a feeling that over the next few years, we're going to see some changes in that. Another limitation of REFS is you can't use EFS, or encrypting file system. That's when you right-click on a file or folder and encrypt your data. Um, but uh, is, NTFS does do that. Um, but EFS does, I'm sorry, REFS does support BitLocker. So BitLocker is something that uh, works with RES, REFS volumes, uh, so you can encrypt an entire hard drive. But a lot of people like to use EFS because it doesn't require the entire hard drive to become encrypted in order to encrypt files and folders. Now, there is a couple of different types of disks that you can use within Windows Server. One's called Basic Disk and there's Dynamic Disk. Microsoft created Dynamic Disks to create built-in uh, RAID 5 and RAID 0, so mirroring and parity types of disks. But really, people don't use those, um, and that's because they use hardware RAID. Hardware RAID allows you to do RAID 0, RAID 5, and a bunch of other different types of RAIDs that aren't available in Windows Server. And it can do it much more quickly because it offloads the process to a separate processor, a card that you plug into one of your, uh, your slots on your motherboard. Uh, so most of us are going to be using the basic disks. We're not going to be using dynamic disks. Part of the reason for that is recovery dynamic disks is much more difficult than recovery of basic disks. So not all backup jobs are going to back them up properly. Uh, but uh, basic disks don't have quite as many capabilities as dynamic disks. It's just most likely you probably won't use them anyway. Uh, basic disk is going to be for simple storage, it says here. And it uses partition tables. That is pretty standard. It also uses extended partitions as well. So if you're creating uh, you know, multiple partitions in a drive, then you can do that with a basic disk. Now, it says once you convert a basic to dynamic disk, it cannot be converted back. This actually is not exactly true. Uh, I have called Microsoft before when there was a problem with a dynamic disk, and the fix was to convert it back to, to basic disk, which is using a hidden command that Microsoft didn't want everybody to have. 
Um, but the cat is out of the bag on that, so it is possible to do it. It's just not recommended, and there's still a possibility you'll lose all your data if you try to convert it back from dynamic to basic. Uh, but uh, for the most part, just stick with basic unless you really need to use a dynamic disk. Now, dynamic disks um, do offer some additional features, such as you can make a lot of changes without having to restart your operating system. And you can use disks for creating this fault tolerant storage, such as I mentioned before, you can create, say, a parity RAID 5 disk or a disk uh, mirroring RAID 0. Um, but uh, nobody's going to do that because it's what's called software RAID. Software RAID is super slow. Um, so you want to use a hardware RAID instead where you have a separate card that you plug in and create the RAID before you even install the Windows operating system. Now, regardless of which type of volume you use, uh, you're going to have what's called system volumes and boot volumes. Now, for the most part, most uh, Windows installations are going to be by default. The system and the boot volume are the same thing. They're going to uh, contain the files that are needed to boot up the computer and run the Windows operating system. However, it doesn't have to be that way. You can separate the two if you'd like, and Microsoft recommends that you do it. However, they don't create a very good way of doing it. It's, it's a, there's a lot of extra steps to do it, um, that, and it also can confuse uh, newer uh, IT administrators that come in and they want to make a change to the server and they're like, wait a minute, where's the boot volume? Where's the system volume? And, and instead of being all in the same place, they're not. <laughs> so it's definitely not recommended by me to split them up, even though Microsoft says for speed reasons, they would like to see those split up. So here are some of the different volumes that are supported if you're going to choose dynamic disk. Simple volume, which you would get either with a basic or uh, with a dynamic disk. You can, it, it just, it's just a simple volume. Uh, then you've got spanned volumes. That's where you can take multiple different um, uh, volumes and span them together, sort of uh, in like a RAID 0. I mentioned RAID 0 before was mirroring. That's actually RAID 1. So RAID 1 is mirroring. RAID 0 is more of a spanned volume. That's, so if you took... Uh, multiple different drives and uh, you know put them all together that's a spanned volume bad thing about a spanned volume is, is if a single drive goes bad then the whole volume collapses and you've got nothing left um, so that's it doesn't give you any kind of redundancy then you've got striped volumes striped volumes are going to require that you all have the same size drive so you have uh, unlike spanned which could be any different size drives Stripe volumes all require, say, if you're using one terabyte on one, you have to use one terabyte on all. Uh, and it's going to stripe the data across the different uh, volumes. So if you have a one gigabyte file, it'll put, it'll put a little bit of each of the, that, uh, that one gigabyte file on all the different volumes. And there, therefore, it will be accessible much more quickly. Span volumes doesn't do that. It just puts all the data on one particular drive and then when it gets to the end of that drive, it starts to the next one and then to the next one to the next one. Now to you, it looks all like one big volume, but it's actually using multiple disks. Then you've got the mirrored volume, which is gonna be that RAID 1 I was talking about. RAID 1 will make it so if one drive fails, then it rolls over to another drive. Now the bad thing about that is, is that I've seen many times where mirrored volumes, uh, as the one drive is failed, failing, it corrupts the other drive because the mirror happens so quickly. And then you end up with two corrupted volumes. So um, I don't always recommend mirrored volumes if you have the ability to do a RAID 5 one. A RAID 5 one basically stripes the data but also gives you redundancy that you don't get in any of these other options. You need, you need at least three drives to get a RAID 5 volume, but you can have many more than that if you'd like. And it uses math for a ninth bit. Normally we, we use eight bits when we uh, create data. But a ninth bit is then used for a mathematical equation that allows us to recover. And even if we lose a drive, then that volume will still continue running. Now, if you lose more than one drive, then that volume is going to fail just like any other one. But as long as you don't lose more than one uh, volume or drive, then you're fine. You're going to be able to continue running your, um, your volume and made up of all these different disks. File Server Resource Manager is, is really one of the most underrated utilities that you can use that comes free with Windows Server. It allows you to do things such as quota management, which basically says how, many, how much data a user can save to a particular file share. 
Uh, it does file screening management. File screening basically says, hey, you're not allowed to have certain file types on this shared folder environment. So for instance, uh, if you didn't want the users to copy any executable files from their computer to the server, then that keeps viruses off of the server. So as soon as, say, a virus infects a Windows 11 computer and it tries to copy that data off to uh, the, the server from the client, um, then the, the server will reject that file and therefore it cannot be infected. And you can use it with more than just executable files. You can use you know, JavaScript and many other files as well. It can also give you some storage reporting, let you know what's going on. And it uses uh, file screening using this classification infrastructure. So it gives you the ability to uh, manage all the different file types in groups uh, that, that are classified. File and folder permissions can be configured on NTFS and REFS types of volumes. If you're using FAT, you can only do folder permissions. So you can't right click on the file and change the permissions. You can only do it from the, the uh, file level in FAT, XFAT, FAT32. But from NTFS and REFS, you can, you can do that at the file level and not just the folder level. And I recommend, as I've talked about in, in uh, previous lectures, to assign groups to these shared folders rather than individual users. So that way, when you need to make a change, you just make a change to the group rather than every single shared folder. So that can save you a lot of time and effort. So here's an example uh, when assigning multiple permissions. So if you have Anthony as member of marketing, which has read permissions to the pictures folder, and you assign write permission to Anthony to the pictures folder. So now Anthony has read and write because the person is a member of the marketing group. You just assign the right permission to that marketing group rather than to the individual user. And when you assign the right permission to the marketing group, they get both read and write assigned to any user in the marketing group. So you have basic permissions and advanced permissions. You're hardly ever going to use advanced permissions. They include uh, like about 15 different types of permissions um, that really get granular. It's nice that they're there in some cases when you need them, but for the most part, the basic permissions are going to be just fine. So you can share folders, which you'll be doing in labs, where you right-click on a folder and you go in and you share it, and then you um, apply it to various different uh, applications, users, groups, things like that. So a shared folder is a folder that contains files that a user accesses from their client computer. If all the users could log in locally to the server, they wouldn't need any shared folders, but those users don't have the rights to log in to the server directly. Only administrators are gonna have those rights. So, so if a user needs access to a folder that's shared, uh, then you can do that using the shared folder option. And it does that using what's called a protocol. I remember from a previous lecture, I just I told you about protocols. Protocols are uh, is just a different language. So if you go to a different uh, you know, country and you don't speak their language, that means you don't speak their protocol. Well, there's a protocol in file sharing, and it's called server message block. Now, the first server message block was version one, and it uh, has been hacked. It's been it's something that you no longer want to have around. It was also very noisy and all and all different kinds of things that added extra chatter on the network. However, now we use server message block version three. And in the newest versions of server message block, you've got transparent failover, scale out, multi-channel, direct, all different kinds of technology you're going to learn about in your reading. You also have Windows PowerShell commands for managing server message block and shared folders. You've got pre-authentication, SMB encryption, so you're going to have encryption between the client and the user, so there's no man-in-the-middle attacks that can grab that data on the way in between. And many other SMB features uh, are now included. So creating a file share is a core of uh, sysadmins and IT administrators. And so basically administrators, you know, just right click on that folder and can share that folder with various different users and groups. And permissions have always been a little bit confusing when it comes to SMB because it's a combination of both the share and the security or what's called the file permissions. And uh, what you're going to get is whichever is most restrictive between those two. However, it does get more complicated than that because what you're going to do is take all of the share permissions and you're going to take the most permissive 
and you're going to take all of the security permissions in the security tab and you're going to add up all those permissions like if you're a member of multiple groups inside the security tab for instance and whatever is the most permissive there then between the share and the uh, security tab you take the least amount of permissions so it can definitely get confusing but that's okay because inside the properties of every folder is what's called an effective ta access tab the effective access tab will calculate what the user's access is so if you want to know hey what is tom's access going to be to this folder you plug you go to the effective access tab you plug in tom's name and boom it tells you what access tom is going to have to that folder so in case you're not an, an expert in uh, you know, figuring out all these permissions and calculating them, then that tab will do it for you. Then there's NFS. NFS, Network File System. Uh, we, yeah, I mentioned before SMB. SMB is a Windows protocol. NFS is a Linux and Unix protocol. And so um, uh, Microsoft now understands NFS. And Linux now understands SMB. So uh, it doesn't matter, really matter which one you use because they're accessible from both systems now. You just have to decide which one you're going to use. I would recommend SMB just because it has a lot more options. So NFS version 3 is, was introduced for larger file sizes because it implemented 64-bit. Then you've got NFS 4, which added additional security improved performance. And then you have 4.1 now added for clustering. In order to get Windows to understand NFS, you just have to add in the component, the feature that supports NFS. And then you can now set up NFS shares for those NFS devices that need access. But once again, Linux now supports SMB, so is it really important? I don't think so. When Microsoft came out with it, however, not many Linux devices supported SMB, but now that's no longer the case. Storage spaces are virtual disks, and they're created from free space in a storage pool. So you basically go to the file and storage uh, area, and then you would create um, a, store, a virtual disk from what's called a primordial pool. So if you have multiple disks that, disks that are not being used, then you can pool those together to create things like parity disks, RAID uh, 1, RAID 0, you know, things like that. So the pool is a collection of one or more physical disks that can be create, used to create virtual disks. You can add available unformatted disks to the pool. It's a fairly easy thing to do, and you'll be doing it in one of your labs. And as I talked about earlier with dynamic disks, you can use uh, these pools to create simple volumes, two-way and three-way mirrors, as well as parity volumes. Parity is RAID 5, uh, mirrors are RAID 1, simple is going to be RAID 0. Storage Spaces Direct is a new thing uh, that you can use to uh, basically create some redundancy. It creates highly available storage for storing virtual machine files. And you can use that for both internal storage as well as externally attached storage using something called iSCSI. iSCSI is something else you'll be doing in one of your labs. And it eliminates the need for st shared storage fabric and enables the use of SATA disks, which now are, of course, are a much cheaper cost than, say, SCSI disks, as well as NVM, which are much faster disks. There's lots of uh, additional features that come with Storage Spaces Direct. Very few organizations are using Storage Spaces Direct at this time, although it's good to know what they are. You don't necessarily have to know how to set it up in most cases. So lots of great improvements here as well. Deduplication is awesome. It basically takes when you have multiple files that are exactly the same, and it only saves a copy of one copy of that of the list of files. So one copy of those files, and then uh, all the other files are then deleted, and you get all that storage space back. So if one person wants access to that file that is referenced in one folder, then they can open it up. And if, if somebody else wants to open that same file that's referenced in another folder, then they can open it up. But they're all opening it up from the same location without even realizing it. And it does that by dividing the files into what's called chunks, and it retains only one copy of the chunk. So let's say you've got 10 of these 10 gigabyte files. That adds up to 100 gigabytes. It, what it does is it removes nine of those files and it keeps one of them and it puts it in the chunk store. So inside the chunk store, you're going to find any files that have been deduplicated. 
and the backup program can back up the chunk store to make sure if that one file gets corrupted or deleted, then you'll be able to restore it. Included in this data deduplication service is going to be several components, including the filter driver, the deduplication service, and the garbage collection. So garbage can collect if too many files are left lying around. And so you want to just confirm that that one file is needed and get rid of all the other copies. It's pretty easy to set up data deduplication. It's just a server role. Uh, you go into add roles and features, go into the file and iSCSI services, and then you're going to see this little check box that says data deduplication. You check the box, you run through the installation and you're done. Then all you gotta do is right click on the volume you want to deduplicate inside Server Manager and turn it on, turn on data deduplication. And that's it, you don't have to do anything else. Now it does end up using some additional resources. So if you only were planning on using say 32 gigabytes of RAM on a server, that's running data to duplication, you might want to consider 64-bit. Uh, you might want to consider a higher end processor or faster storage. And that's because deduplication takes a lot of effort. Uh, although it saves you a lot of storage, it does take effort to deduplicate files and to manage those files. So it is a good idea to have more resources available. And you can install that right from Server Manager or from PowerShell. Now, I first used data deduplication within backups. So backups basically would deduplicate files so you didn't have to do it in the server. But by doing it on the server, it saves the storage on the server instead of just in the backup. So I, I prefer nowadays to use the deduplication on the server, then you don't need to use it on the backup, which normally is an extra licensing fee from the third-party backup application if you're using one iSCSI implementation. So as I mentioned before, you'll be doing this in one of your labs. And what this does is it allows you to connect to a box of hard drives, you know, what we call uh, a, a SAN, storage area network. And that SAN can be a lot of different things. It can be another server running the iSCSI target server role. It can be a device from IBM or from HP or from Dell that is just a box of hard drives running a Linux operating system. And you communicate using the open source iSCSI protocol because both Linux and Windows talk iSCSI. And then you connect to it using, uh, using TCP IP and uh, you connect to it using the IP address or the name, whatever it is you wanna use and then you can connect to that storage. And then that storage can show up as a drive letter on your server. So even though the storage is not local uh, to your server, it will look like it is local. It'll appear local to all the applications and all the other features and roles that are being used on your Windows server. You should have a really good high-speed connection directly between your server and the SAN device. Uh, and that's because uh, it's not local to your server, so it's not gonna be as fast. So if you have at least one gigabit in speed, 10 gigabit would be preferred. You can go as high as 40 gigabit. Uh, then you can connect to your SAN device and fast enough where you won't even realize that it's not local iSCSI uses a different size uh, data packet. So a typical data packet maxes out at like 1500 bytes. However, an iSCSI data packet can use what's called jumbo packets, which can be around 10,000 bytes. So instead of 1500, you're using much bigger chunks of data. And that can be a real advantage when sending data back and forth between an external device and the Windows server. So in this module, we talked all about file systems, volume permissions, file server management, SMB, storage, deduplication, and iSCSI. And that will do it for module four in our course.